Hello everyone. Welcome to the Analyst of 24th September where we bring to you the in-depth analysis of the important articles from both the Hindu and Indian Express. So let's get on to the table of contents. In the first article, we will be talking about the working of National Investigation Agency which is seen high on activity with respect to the Manipur militancy issue and the Khalistani controversy. In the second one, we will study the trend in the rise in global debt, what are the causes and what are the mitigation strategies. In the third, we will have a discussion on semiconductor industry in India in light of the launch of India's first chip fabrication industry. Next is analysis of the endangered species of Nilgiri Teher and its habitat. And the last one, we will do the case study of Bihuna Didi or Swati Nayak, who has been recently given the Norman Borlaug Award. So let's get started. In the first topic, we will deal with the issue of internal security. NIA has confiscated the properties of a Khalistani terrorist, Pannu. So, what is the context? So, to be precise, NIA has confiscated Pannu's property in Amritsar and Chandigarh following the orders of NIA special court. So, in this analysis, we will not only study the working of NIA agency, but we will also do analysis of the special courts. Now, to begin with, what is this National Investigation Agency? Now, in simple terms, this is a central law enforcement agency in order to regulate or in order to have counter-terrorism activities in India. So what is the mandate of NIA? The mandate is basically to perform investigation of all these offences, all the offences which can harm or threaten the very sovereignty, security and unity of the India. Now, there can be many offences, but broadly, NIA deals with two types of offences. One are the terror-related offences and the second are the augmented uh, offences which are given in the Schedule of NIA Act. These are called Scheduled Offences. What are these offences? That we shall be reading in the next slide. So, now when we understand the mandate of NIA, what has led to the formation? See, the formation can be linked in the wake of Mumbai terror attack of 2008, which is famously known as the 2611 terror attack of Mumbai, which alarmed the whole world and therefore called upon creating a proactive body to counter terrorism in India. And so the UPA government of that time created the NIA Act in the year 2008, which got enforced in the year 2009. Okay. This is also a central agency which comes under the mandate, the jurisdiction of Ministry of Home Affairs, a fact that you need to remember for prelims examination. Now, what about the jurisdiction of National Investigation Agency? First of all, all the terror-related offences or the scheduled offences. Now, what are we calling as scheduled offences? These are terrorism-related offences or one which augments terrorism in one way or the other. This would include your Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, UAPA. This would include using explosive substances, misusing the atomic energy infrastructure of India, hijacking things. So there is Anti-Hijacking Act. Then there is a multilateral convention called SARC Convention for the Suppression of Terrorism Act. This is also one of the schedules which extends its jurisdiction to NIA. Next would be Narcotics Drug, Psychotropic Substances Act, Weapons of Mass Destruction and the Delivery System Act. So all of these offences are also under the mandate of NIA. This is something that you need to know. Now, when it comes to the region of influence, region of jurisdiction, it definitely covers all of the India. But not only that, it has now also been empowered to cover or have jurisdiction outside the India as well in certain cases. So what are these cross-border jurisdiction of NIA? First of all, it is extended to all the Indian citizens who are residing abroad. Second, it is extended to all the persons in the government service irrespective of wherever they are living. Then, if you are any person, be of Indian origin 
or a, a citizen of say us a citizen of uh, a, say uk and you are there on the registered ships and aircrafts which are registered in india and you will also come under the jurisdiction of nia next any person any person be it a be it a citizen or be it a foreigner who has performed these scheduled offenses against an indian or against india's interest will also be included in the jurisdiction next would be the trials of these offenses are mandated to be conducted by the special courts that these special courts are there to expedite the trials so that faster delivery of justice can be ensured these special courts basically perform trials and these special courts are given powers by central government a special court is created under section 11 and section 12 of the nia act the person who is going to preside the judge who is going to preside the special court is going to be nominated or appointed by the central government after having due consultation with the chief justice of a high court so this is about the special court a sessions court can now also be converted into a special court this is this has recently came into the nia provisions from the recent amendment that we are going to see later now let's understand the working of nia the cases that nia pursues are basically referred to it or they have been taken under su moto cognizance so first let's talk about the referral system so in case a state government suspects that any activity is getting conducted in order to harm the sovereignty security and unity of the country then in that case under empowered under section 6 of the act the state government can refer such cases to the nia but nia will not directly take up these cases these cases will now be taken under the cognizance of central government central government will do will do the due assessment of the details of the case and then it will direct the agency to take over such cases so only after getting permission from the central government will nia start its proceedings in this case state governments are required to or to required to extend all assistance to the nia second would be the referral coming directly from central government now in case an offense is getting conducted in india or outside india then who will be having the, the who will be having the power to give nia the permission to conduct the trials this would be central government so central government either by the referral from the state government referral from some other country or by su moto cognizance would direct the nia to take up the probe all right now let's come to the sanctioning power of the nia now as we know that the offenses that is going to deal with are essentially of criminal nature so it has got the power to sanction or it has got the power of a court under crpc 1973 so it follows the sections of crpc in order to sanction for prosecuting the accused under schedule offenses it seeks the sanction of the central government so again there is a central government bias in adjudicating the cases or giving the cases for probe to the nia now there are some other provisions as well as to its working it also deals with the nexalist cases so it also has an exclusive left wing extremism cell left wing extremism corresponds to naxalism in india which has got its name because it originated initially in the naxal badi district of west bengal so it has also got an exclusive left wing extremism cell to effectively deal with the cases which are related to the naxalist group and their terror financing so this was about the working of the nia how does it get the referrals and how it imposes sanctions under which uh, under whose permission they start their probe so this is something that we have read now what are the challenges pertaining to nia first and foremost is the complex nature of terrorist networks these days we are not now dealing with a with a particular nation's terrorist group they are operating across the borders for example your jaish e mohammed your lashkar e taiba they have their operations across border 
so it becomes very difficult to track them the next one would be to have international cooperation and extradition issues next one are the issues of extradition and gaining international cooperation in countering terrorism activities now there are some legal challenges there are some diplomatic challenges when it comes to prosecute the citizens of another country because it also has some repercussion on our diplomatic ties an example of this would be the long investigation in the case of david hadley who was associated with us in order to get his or get him prosecuted so he was associated with the mumbai terror attack of 2008 and this was a long lengthy process of uh, of talks between us and india so such is the case of international cooperation and the issues underlying with it next is prevalence of cyber challenges so nowadays the way the terrorists are operating is basically inside the digital net or through the cyber warfare they are pursuing terrorism they are using social media they are using dark nets which makes it very difficult to monitor their activities to track their activities and to curb it so the digital warfare the cyber warfare has become another menace for nia next is political and legal complexity if a case has particularly involved a politically active person then the central government would be would become biased to it the central the state government would become biased to it and as a result of this the efficient working the impartial working of nia would be compromised next having coordination with state authorities is also difficult because the first referral has to be made from the state government and in case the state is not cooperating it becomes a very tedious process next is public and media scrutiny now there have been so many instances like the malegaon case like the pulwama attack where the whole issue was under the eyesight of public under the eyesight of media and as a result of this a lot of details were leaked out which again poses a challenge in the working of nia now many of these challenges have been taken care by the recent amendments in the nia act so the nia act was recently amended in 2018 whose objective was to have speedy investigation and prosecution of the trials of the terrorists that are under nia probe it had basically three domains of empowerment first and foremost it widened the scope of area so before in the previous act the nia officer could only have probe for or inside the jurisdiction inside the boundary of india but now it was extended to all the citizens outside the india as well second widening the scope of law it was understood that terrorism nowadays is not just limited to money laundering hijacking and uap etc it is also associated with human trafficking with cyber terrorism which we just read and with counterfeiting notes as well so these provisions were also included into its jurisdiction all right next it wanted to expedite the number of cases which are coming at the disposal of nia for that it was allowed uh, to the central government to create sessions court and create them as special courts which has paved the way for the nia to create a terrorism free india in the next one we will see what are the reasons of the rise in global debt what is the context that according to global debt monitor report of institute of international finance it has been observed that global debt has rose to an all time high of 307 trillion in the second quarter by the end of june 2023 now before getting into the topic let's first understand what is a debt that is nothing but a borrowed money for example you want to buy a bike which is costing you 1 lakh rupees you have only got 50000 rupees at your disposal but you really want to buy the bike what you will be doing you will be you will be buying that another 50000 rupees in order to fill the gap that borrowed money you will promise to the lender that you will be paying it back with some increased interest with some more or additional money now when it comes to debt depending upon who's taking the debt it can be further classified into public debt and private debt now if the government borrows money then it is called a public debt but if an individual like you and me or if corporations are buying money then it is called a private debt if we see in the case of global scenarios or in the case of indian scenario it is seen as a general trend that the public debt outweighs the total private debt of the country but when we talk about the global debt 
it includes not just the public debt but also the private debt so it has seen in the last few years that this total debt this global and this public and private debt is on an increase this is what we are going to analyze in this discussion so first of all why do government takes debt in the first place it's understood that private debts are taken in order to pursue investment in order to purchase commodities and services but why do governments take debt first of all in order to finance the infrastructure project in order to lay down your roads your railways your airports which eventually creates a multiplier effect in the economy it boosts the economic growth it it boosts employment in the country so therefore it pursues some borrowing next is to provide social services social services like your health care for example ayushman bharat scheme is given to you for example manrega is there for example uh, your uh, say health protection or your food security schemes or your social security schemes are there so all of these are the social services which government intends to provide you because it is a socialist government and now this government will be taking some borrowing from other countries either it's it's going to be the internal debt or external debt they are going to take some money in order to fund these very services next is to stimulate the economic growth as we have already seen that when government intends to provide you social services or infrastructure project that would also involve creation of employment creation of it it has a multiplier effect it causes or it leads to economic growth next is in order to respond to emergency in case your country or your state is struck with some disaster or some unforeseen circumstances like a pandemic then in that case the government resources are burdened and it tends to seek a lot of borrowings so this also causes increase in borrowing now in order to cover the budgetary deficits when does a budgetary deficit takes place so basically when the expenditure of the government has outgrown the revenue for example the government has ex- has spent about 100 rupees and it had gained the revenue of only sif of only 70 rupees in that particular financial year then there will be definitely a gap of 30 rupees which it has to fulfill because it is mandated that the budgetary deficit should always be zero mind you this is not fiscal deficit the budgetary deficit is ought to be zero in order to create a net zero budgetary deficit we have to fix this amount which is in deficit so this very amount is called the fiscal deficit of the of the government and in order to cover this fiscal deficit government performs borrowing so i hope this concept is clear to you now so as you can see that government's debt especially with regards to india has been on continuous rise and it has rise steeply during the covid years what is the recent finding of the report now so let's quickly have a brief about it first of all it has highlighted that there has been record high debt while the debt was already increasing the trend has been a gradual increase in the debt but it has reached an all time high of 307 trillion in the second quarter of 2023 that is in the june second we have witnessed a decade long increase which means over the past decade global debt has surged by approximately 100 trillion dollar which is the fastest till now next is the increasing debt to gdp ratio so the trend that was observed before was there was a declining debt to gdp ratio so far but from now we are seeing that it has also started to rise again reaching up to 336% of the gdp with regards to india we can observe that the public debt according to the budget 2023 has been recorded at a high of 89.26% of the gdp while the private debt is at 58.42% of the gdp and what is the frbm target of us as frbm target is to limit it well below 60% of the gdp so this is basically an alarming situation now what are the factors that are driving the global debt and the india's debt also first is we need not to be worrying about the rising debt because it has been a historical trend it has been a historical trend to have both nominal and global debt to gdp ratio growing at a pace why because government always ought to have more expenditure as compared to its revenue so definitely it will be borrowing 
but the concern is that there is a steep rise in the borings at the scene so what are the issues what are the causes of it first of all the pandemic effect the pandemic which struck the whole world in 2019 now during this time surprisingly it was seen that the global debt growth temporarily halted this halt was because of the economic slowdown because of clamping down of the production activities the whole supply chain as a result of this the natural borrowings that is especially the private borrowings fall down so therefore due to reduced lending activities the global debt growth has temporarily halted as seen from this article the recent trends that is given by this article is that global debt levels have begun rising again after pandemic recovery and a significant portion of this debt that is 80% is coming from the developed nations like US like UK like Japan and China and also from market economies like India China Brazil etc now it also corresponds to steady expansion of money supply activities in many countries government is trying to pursue dovish policy where it is trying to given or pump in a lot of money in the economy in order to boost the economic growth which got slowed down during pandemic so all of these are basically pandemic recovery efforts so on there is also seen a rise in the savings and investments and these savings now have been seen to be channeled into investment as a result of this private investments are on a rise private debt is on a rise this is another trend seen from this article what are the general reasons attributed to the rise of debt first of all government spending to mitigate the effects of the pandemic in order to mitigate the effect it provided healthcare it provided a lot of supplies it provided a lot of social security measures in order to safeguard the people especially the vulnerable sections the migrants the elderly so which costed on its pocket as a result of this the expenditure increased and as a result of which the borrowings also increased now the low interest rates the central banks across the world have lowered the interest rate in order to pump more money supply in the economy in order to pursue economic growth as i have already told so the lower interest rates have basically created cheaper loans so therefore people have resorted to have more borrowings likewise likewise for the government also next is an aging population so in many countries like in germany in japan in many european nations you are seeing that the average population is going more than 65 the the majority of the population is going well above 65 years of age which means there is an increased burden on the economy because they have to be provided with health support with security support with elderly support so in order to pursue all these measures again a lot of expenditure needs to be done from the behalf of government of many developed and advanced economies therefore it was said that they are contributing to more than 80% of the global debt share next is climate change now in order to abate global climate change countries have adopted some ndcs nationally determined contributions under the cop and now this has made them to install a lot of renewable energy infrastructure adopt a lot of climate resilient and mitigation strategies climate resilient agriculture and all of these are although invited steps these are welcoming steps but they are pretty expensive also so therefore these expenses have again made the government to borrow the money next is the geopolitical tensions which are going on especially the ukraine war which has increased the rise of the import prices import products prices as a result of this expenditure has increased overall increasing the borrowing now another trend that has been observed from this report is a drop in the global debt as a share of gdp so in 2023 up till 2023 it was seen that the global debt as a share of gdp was declining but now we are seeing that that is now increasing it is attributed to inflation now which has allowed the governments to effectively diminish the value of their debts denominated in the local currency now what happens one more measure to counter the borrowings or to counter the fiscal deficit would be to create new currency fresh currency in local denominations so what government is doing now if it is it is having a fiscal deficit of 30 rupees it will be creating 30 rupees fresh notes but this measure is inflationary in nature 
it is producing more uh, money in the economy now this method is known as inflating away debt in which we are trying to create fresh currency it's fine till we create fresh currency but then that is creating inflation that inflation is again increasing the amount of debt and so we get into a vicious cycle so this is a trend that has been highlighted by this article now, what are the concerns and implications first and foremost such a steep rise in debt is also causing unsustainable debt in the nations for example if you get a lot of debt you are not able to repay it your economy will slow down as a result of this you would require some borrowings now because your economy is not supporting the output not supporting the growth this borrowing will again come in the form of debt you are taking debt from another country or another finance institution this is again reinforcing your debt scenario so you get into the trap of an unsustainable debt financing or unsustainability of debt this is a vicious cycle so as we can see that many countries majority of the countries are well above the level of 60% of debt, debt to gdp ratio which basically means that they are having debt much more than their economic production capacity this is one big concern that is flagged from this article now the government debt is on a steep rise why because it can be seen that on account of elections on account of purging populist program reckless borrowing is done by the government in the name of one scheme or the other second is increasing interest rates can strain the government with substantial debt burden potentially leading to default or inflation driven debt reduction what is this inflation driven debt reduction in which we pursue methods like creating new money in order to facilitate or in order to curb this borrowing in order to curb this fiscal deficit as a result of which we are also injecting inflation in the economy so rapid private debt growth is also a concern as it is often linked to unsustainable economic booms and both of these measures can create a 2008 global financial crisis like situation so we need to safeguard our economies against this what are the mitigating measures what are the multifaceted way forward first and foremost is compliance to fiscal discipline and prudent borrowing an example of this can be seen in the fiscal responsibility and budgetary management act of india where we have set debt targets deficit targets with regards to both central government and state government so in the case of uh, central in the case of central government our frbm debt to gdp target is of 60% are we complying to it are we in it no so we need to work harder for it next is european union stability and growth pact it is similar to that of frbm here it imposes some limits borrowing limits on all the member countries of eu next are the debt restructuring and relief programs this restructuring is done on behalf of imf institutions like imf like world bank in order to wave off or in order to help the countries who are debt ridden so in the year 2000 and in in the year 1996 and in the year 2006 it was seen that heavily indebted poor country initiative and multilateral debt relief initiative was launched by world bank and imf and also there was an informal lending group in the europe called as paris club which was helping all the debted nations of the world so these are some of the relief programs which we can resort to next is enhancing our own economic growth enhancing economic growth not just of our own country but also of our allies also of the other countries of the world by providing supply chain resilience infrastructure by providing investments and revenue generation so one example would be china's belt and road initiative where it is trying to build a string of pearls which will try to boost economic growth not just of china but also of the participant nations next is to have transparent debt lending and you know responsible lending this can be provided by a case study or by an example which is showcased by g20 during the covid years so what it did in a very humanitarian effort it temporarily waived off the debt services or the paying back of your loans during the covid years so this is how this is was and this was under debt service suspension initiative of g20 so in line of these efforts we can ensure that the global economy growth and prosperity is ensured in a sustainable developmental fashion coming to the third topic of the day micron begins construction of india's first chip assembly plant in regards to this we will study about 
the semiconductor industry in India. What is the context in brief? The US memory chip maker Micron Technology has initiated the construction of its semiconductor packaging plant in Gujarat state. So this is important from prelims point of view. This is India's first such facility. Now as always before getting into the topic, first let's learn about what are semiconductors. So as the name suggests, semiconductors are the materials which are having an intermediate conductivity between con conductors and insulators. Which means that they are not as good conductors as metals, but they are also not as bad insulators as say plastics. Semiconductors can be regulated. So basically it has got regulated conductivity. How do you regulate this conduction? By either having pure semiconductor chips or by performing doping. Doping is induction of P-type or N-type impurities so that we regulate how semiconductor behave. Semiconductors can be made in such a way that they are created in the form of a transistor. In the form of a transistor, this transistor would only pass say current of 5 volt. It would allow current of 5 volt that is flowing in this particular direction and it would not allow any other voltage current to flow across it. This is how we will be able to regulate the conductivity with the help of semiconductors. Now, because of these unique properties, it forms the backbone of the modern ICT industry of the world. Hence, it is very very important to utilize this asset. What is the need of policy thrust for having semiconductor manufacturing in India? First of all, as we know that data is the new oil and similarly semiconductors are the new refineries of the modern ICT age. They are the drivers of the ICT age and the fourth industrial revolution. All the technologies that you are seeing around, be it the telecommunication technology, be it the internet of things, the big data, the artificial intelligence, everything is driven by the chips that are created by semiconductors. Next. There is a huge geopolitical significance upcoming with regards to semiconductor. This geopolitics is also known as silicon politics, where trade wars are going on between the countries because semiconductor industry is highly localized. So if you want to wage an indirect war against a country, directly cut down the supply chain with them or directly burn their industry. This has been seen in, seen in few examples also with regards to US and China's trade war. Not only that, there is aggressive acquisition of the manufacturing industries that's taking place. A lot of it is acquired by either US or it is concentrated by the East Asian countries like South Korea, like Taiwan, like Japan, like China. Also, it has got some strategic implications. The electronics sector is basically fed by a semiconductor and you will find application of electronics everywhere, especially in the defense, in the, in the atomic uh, energy sector, in your transport sector, in your telecommunication sector. So whoever gets a stronghold of semiconductor production will be able to bolster its national security and will be able to threaten national security of some other country. So a lot of geopolitical significance has also come up. Next is to reduce the reliance on the import. Currently, India is globally the ninth importer of semiconductors, especially from China. About 70% of all the semiconductor that India has is imported. This is flagging the concern that there is a need to become self-reliant or atmanirbhar in, in semiconductor production. Second, it is crucial for the strategic areas. These strategic areas, as I have already told you, would include defense, creation of missiles, would include satellites creation, would include telecommunication sector, would include communication sector, would include transport sector, ICT sector, so on and so forth. So, therefore, it's important to have a strong stronghold in the semiconductor area. Next is potential to become a global leader. India has got this potential. Why? Because about about 20% of the total global workforce on semiconductor is coming from India. A lot of it has been brain drained across because of poor IPR rights in India, poor research atmosphere in India and also a low level of infrastructure in India. So India has all the potential of becoming global leader. It is projected that India can have a hundred billion production worth production of semiconductors in the world. Today, the global production is standing at $500 billion. Just imagine if we are able to 
if we are able to exploit our full potential we will be able to get the recognition of being global leader next is semiconductors have got a multiplier effect because semiconductors are the baselines these are the life blood of the ict industry of the modern industrial revolution therefore everything eventually has semiconductors in them so if you are having immense production of semiconductor that will also propel the economic growth of many other industries and those industries increased production will ultimately contribute to the economic growth of your nation it will also boost employment it is said that semiconductors have potential of creating as many as 1 million employment in india next what are the challenges faced by this industry first and foremost let's understand the stages of creation of semiconductor first of all is the designing one second the manufacturing of the chip next is end product integration now out of these three stages india is active only in the integration part we are nowhere near in the designing nowhere near in the manufacturing designing the 40% of world semiconductor designing is done by usa now and a lot of manufacturing is done by taiwan so not only is this industry localized which is the biggest disadvantage but also india is challenged because we are not able to exploit stage 2 and stage 1 now when we are getting this industry of manufacturing chip manufacturing in india via micron and that is a very welcoming step in this regard because now we will become active in stage 2 also next semiconductor industries are very expensive in order to install one plant you would require a minimum 10 billion dollars of investment second it is a critical sector it is critical or it is very sensitive sector sensitive to not only the water it should have ultra pure water for synthesis of manufact uh, for synthesis of semiconductors but it should also have a dust free environment it should also have a regulated temperature which is of which is which is well below 18 degree centigrade in order to have proper manufacturing so it is a very sensitive area would require a lot of infrastructure development and regulation and controlling next it has long gestation process in order to produce one in order to produce one chip essentially if we see it requires anywhere about 5 to 9 months of time so it has got long gestation period which means that if i do a lot of capital investment and set up a industry right now i will not be getting in the 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 returns immediately it will take some time to scale the production and reap the benefits okay next is this industry is very intensive intensive on capital as we have already seen 10 billion would be required in setting up one plant next it is power intensive it requires round the clock supply 24/7 supply of high power energy next it is skill intensive only advanced skills people would be able to operate in the semiconductor industry next it has got long term returns definitely but at the same time because the gestation period is long you cannot expect to gain benefits or profits from this industry or from the production in quick time so that is again one disadvantage one challenge next india is operant only in the third stage because we have got many issues the infrastructural issue transport issue logistic issue ipr challenges are also there in india next this industry is highly localized as we have already seen before so what are the way forward and the government initiatives that are supporting it see first and foremost we need to put in more money into semiconductor industries financial support of the government hence becomes a very instrumental a very crucial measure so financial support is government not already providing it yes it is providing through many incentivizing schemes first it is trying to incentivize the design linked production through the dli scheme here the ipr related challenges could be dealt with here new innovative designs can be created from indian minds and that will be incentivized by the government not only that it is also trying to incentivize establishment of manufacturing units from foreign companies or from indian companies in india this is through production linked or very famously known as pli scheme under the atmanirbhar bharat package so it helps to incentivize production next is India semiconductor mission launched in 2020 and the specs mission that is a scheme for promoting and manufacturing of not just the semiconductor but also electronics component in the indian market not only that we also require to have a cluster based development 
because the entire supply chain of semiconductor industry is broadly divided into three to four stages, but it has got more than 500 fragmented stages. All of them also poses some of the transport related challenges, logistic related challenges, infrastructure or cold chain infrastructure related challenges. So in order to deal with all of these, we need to have a clustered development. Government is already pursuing it in the form of electronics manufacturing clusters 2.0. Next, we need to have foreign investments. We need to attract it. Why? Because this is a capital intensive industry. So, in order to expedite the manufacturing units, in order to expedite the production of semiconductors in India, we need to attract foreign investment and government is doing it with the help of initiatives like Semicon India, which is basically a conference whereby many foreign investors, many foreign diplomats are called upon and they are made to invest or have their invest or have their uh, companies in the Indian soil. Semicon India was recently held uh, on 29th of July in New Delhi. Then we also need to have collaborations with the global giants. So global giants like Foxconn, like Micron that we recently saw are already active like Intel also. They are already active but they are not augmented with the Indian technologies. Therefore, we can also collaborate these global giants with public sector enterprises in order to bring more Atmanirbharta and Indianness into the production system. So PSEs like Bharat Electronics Limited, like HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited can be clubbed up. Next, we need to have advanced skill development courses for the graduates and for our uh, postgraduates so that we can have a stronger and more equipped workforce to have there in uh, the semiconductor industry. Now, these training modules would require you to learn technologies like VLSI, development technologies like MOSFET, like chip designing, etc. So, when we take up when we take up these way forwards, we will be able to make a stride, become a global leader in semiconductor manufacturing across the world. Coming to the next topic, this is very important from prelims point of view because more often than not, they ask about important places and species in news and in this particular article, we are going to read both of them. So, the news is that Tamil Nadu and Kerala government are joining hands to count the endangered Nilgiri Tehir. The context says that both the Tamil Nadu and Kerala forest departments are joining hand, which will also make us to study the distribution of habitat of Nilgiri Tehir. So what is this species? Nilgiri Tehir is basically Nilgiri Ibex. Ibex stands for a wild goat, a goat which is having longer than usual horns, a very huge body, many furs, smaller legs and also resembles sheep in many cases. Why is it called Nilgiri? Because the species is endemic to Nilgiri hills which means it will be found nowhere in the world except for the Nilgiri sphere or in the Nilgiri biosphere reserve. It is declared as endangered species because it is very localized also. It has got many, uh, many poachers after it. It has got many threats that we will be reading in the next slide. So it is declared as endangered and has been accorded highest levels of production, protection under Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Also, it has been accorded as the highest conservation status in the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, where it has been enlisted in the Schedule 1 species. Okay, it is also called saddle bag because the adult species have got a saddle on their back and also a grey spot on their bags, which is nowhere to be found in any other deer species across the world. So they are also called saddleback species. They are state animals of Tamil Nadu and they are endemic to Nilgiri Hills. Now what are these Nilgiri Hills, where are they located and what is the habitat distribution of this endangered species? Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve or Nilgiri Hills are basically hills of western ghats, which are spread over the three states of Karnataka, Kerala and Tamil Nadu. But Nilgiri Teher is more widely spread in the southern regions of Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. Therefore, they are more widespread in Tamil Nadu and in the in the in Tamil Nadu and in Kerala state. It is a keystone species in the Mukurti National Park, which is in Tamil Nadu, and its highest population is found in the Eravikulam National Park, which is in the Munnar district of Kerala. So hence, these two governments are collaborating with each other to count its number. 
Now, when we talk about more specific habitat of Nilgiri Tehir, they reside in the Shola forest of the Nilgiri hills. So, basically, Nilgiri hills have got some grasslands in the top at the elevation of about 1200 kilometers to 2600 meters. At an elevation of about 1200 to 2600 meters. So, because they are there in the elevation, they are also having mountainous or mountain like ecosystem. Therefore, they are also called mountain grasslands or shrublands. So, what is happening as you can see from this infographic, as you can see from this picture, there is a huge grassland at the top of the Nilgiri hills which are having scattered pocket of forests small forested trees are there and this region is known as Shola forest or Shola ecosystem and they are the resident main residents of the Shola forest only. Now there are certain threats which has led to degradation of their population. First one is habitat loss. Habitat loss not only because of anthropogenic activities like urbanization like poaching activity by men but also by bringing of invasive species like eucalyptus like other deer species which threaten their livelihood. Next is poaching activity and the most important one is them being isolated. They are endemic to Nilgiris which means nowhere else to be found which means if God forbid any virus attacks takes place or forest fires takes place then it will gravely endanger their population. Next is the impact of climate change because of climate change there is growth in forest fires, there is uh, degradation in the, in the water table and there is also many polluting activities which are endangering their habitat. So what are the conservation efforts by the government of India? Well very recently in fact in the last year only Tamil Nadu government has created this project of Nilgiri Teher which is dedicated to this species and it was launched in the year 2022. Only by the Tamil Nadu government, Kerala government was not involved in this. Next comes the project Tiger. Project Tiger launched in 1973 is responsible for preserving this umbrella species tiger. Umbrella species means if you protect this species, then it will be protecting all the species ultimately inside this umbrella. So as a result of this, when you go to conserve tigers in the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve, you will also be uh, conserving these endangered species. Next, creation of Western Ghat Ecological Authority which is there for preservation of the ecology and the culture of the Western Ghats also responsible for protecting Nilgiris. Teher. Next, Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. So, under the Man and Biosphere Reserve program of UNESCO, it was formed. The Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve was formed. So, basically according it higher protection status. Now comes the last topic which is a very unique case study. This is important not only from prelims point of view from biotechnology and agriculture perspective but it will also give you a very good case study for agriculture and for ethics. So what is the news? Swati Nayak who is dearly called as Bihona Didi by the local community in Odisha has recently won the Norman Borlock award for introducing drought resilient rice in Odisha. So, Let's first read something about this news. Swati Nayak, who is an agricultural scientist in the International Rice Research Institute, which is headquartered in Philippines and has also got regional headquarters in New Delhi, has recently, be, has recently been honored by the Norman Borlaug Award of, for 2023. Now, she is fondly remembered as Bihona Didi by the local communities in Odisha. Why? for having innovative work and a long time work in researching the drought tolerant rice varieties and also for applying these varieties in the field. So this variety is called Shahabhagi Dan in Odisha. This you can use as an example in agriculture or in climate resilient agriculture. Then this rice variety has helped to improve the economic prosperity of the region the agricultural income related stability to the farmers, their social security, their food security and has also overall helped the livelihoods of the region. Now, this has also helped them to build climate resilient agricultural practices and develop nutritious rice variety. Let's talk about the award now. Norman Borlaug Award is given in the field of agriculture for pursuing field research and application 
in order to ensure food security in the world that comes with line in line with sdg goal number 2 this is given by Rockefeller Foundation along with World Food Prize Foundation. That is why this award is also known as World Food Prize Award. But it was given the name of Norman Borlaug because he is an American agricultural scientist who is known as the father of green revolution in the world. This, just like how we have seen MS Swaminathan as being accorded with the status of father of Indian, Revo Indian green revolution. Similarly, he is the Swaminathan of USA. Now, when you get this award, you get to have a $10,000 worth cash prize. And also the eligibility is basically that you have to be under the age of 40. Now, what are some other climate resilient agricultural practices? Now, the first method would be to naturally have drought resistant crop variety species. Now, this would include your Shah Bagi Dhan of, uh, uh, of Bihona Didi. And the second one, an example of it would be the drought guard rice varieties of that is developed basically in Africa. And there are many other examples. So first is to have drought resistant crop varieties. Second, to perform crop rotation and diversification. So intercropping mechanisms should be there where you are combining the traditional crops with drought resistant crop. Which crops are naturally drought resistant? It's your millet. So we can also try to fructify our millet economy this way. Next is to perform conservation agriculture. This is where you try to conserve the natural ecosystem of the area. Which means you are not performing tilling, you are not applying fertilizer, you are not applying pesticides. This question has also appeared in the prelims of UPSC. So, conservation agriculture can also be pursued where no tilling, zero budget natural farming, farming can be performed. Next, to lower the water footprint also. This is by having water management techniques. You can have water harvesting systems. You can have, you can install sprinkler system or you can also install precision agriculture infrastructure, precision irrigation infrastructure. And last but not the least would be to have agroforestry or shelter belt. So here you will try to crop the traditional the traditional crops or plants along with some tree species, usufruct tree species. So these species will not only provide you natural shade, but will also provide you a natural protection against winds, against animal infiltration, against any other harm. Also, it will provide you shelter belts and it will also help to double farmers income in line with India's vision. Why? Because you will not be able to, you will not only be able to get the production from the crops, but also from these trees. Their fruits, their roots, their stems can also be utilized. So in this way, we will be able to bring vibrancy into our agricultural practices. This was all for today. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.